morning, everyone. Those of us here at ACI and all our brothers and sisters uh, online, you're very welcome to the second Africa Bible and Christianity Seminar. Dr. Rudolf Gezi, who is director of the Center for the Study of Early African Christianity here in ACI. We thank God that you are all here, and it's our privilege to have to do the opening prayer. The Deputy Rector of ACI, Professor Philip Lai. Let us bow down and have a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious and most merciful Father, we thank you for this Friday morning bringing us together for yet another conference of the Center for the Study of Early African Christianity. Thank you for previous programs that we've had in the past. And we thank you for the opportunity to listen to one such presentation. It is our hope and our prayer that you will be amongst us. As your word has taught us, wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. We pray that we'll feel your presence here with us and that, Lord, you would guard and guide us to give us insight. We pray for our presenter, the Most Reverend Dr. Robert Abwajimensa, who is making time with us here. We pray for your strength and courage. We pray for wisdom. We pray for the endowment from the Holy Spirit that, Lord, you'd guide him aright that this presentation would be of immense significance. It would be a contribution to our understanding of the role that Africans played in the early Jesus community. We pray for the participants. We pray that, Lord, we would not leave this meeting will not leave this event uh, having not experienced you. We are sure that you would work it out in our lives to the praise and to the glory of your holy name. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As part of CCAC's um, efforts mm -hmm. to explore and promote the relevance of early Christian presence in parts of Africa, especially in the first six centuries of Christian history for contemporary African Christianity. The Africa Bible and Christianity Seminar seeks to provide a platform for investigation and discussion of the intercession of these three areas. And special attention, of course, is given to insights from early centuries Christian activities in Africa. So the format has been that we give scholars and students of early and contemporary African Christianity the liberty to share their interests and recent scholarship in a seminar or colloquium format and hope that such presentations encourages further discussions on a presented subject matter that the presenter uh, is particularly interested in or interested on. The seminar we are envisage will usually take place on the on or around 7th of July every year, which happens to be the birthday of our director, the late Reverend Professor Kwame Bediako. Uh, whose eventual vocation and scholarship, as many of us are aware, traversed in an integrated manner 
the areas of Africa, Bible, and Christianity. And so I hope that we continue to explore um, this hybrid mode of in-person and online. Um, and maybe, who knows, in the future we may take some small coins to facilitate the activity. But for now, it's free. So let's enjoy while it is free. The first in the series was presented by Dr. F.B.A. Esiedu, a historian and writer on the topic, From the Nations to the Nations, Josephus, Paul's Letters, Abraham, and the African Future. We had this last year on the 21st of July, uh, 2022, here at ACI and online as well. So it is my honor and delight to once again welcome you all. So thank you once again, and I pray that we all enjoy ourselves in this seminar. God bless. Thank you very much, Director. We continue the program as we um, introduce the chairperson for today's event. And in the person of Dr. Solomon Sulisa. Dr. Solomon Sulisa is a senior research fellow here in Akrofi Chrysler Institute and also serves as the dean of accredited studies. So Dr. Sulisa, if, if you kindly move up uh, to the high table together with the speaker for the day, that will greatly serve our purpose. All right. Okay, so, uh, Dr. Sulis, uh, the ball is in the court. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Dr. Walton. Thank you so very much for this great honor. And I would like to thank God for the opportunity given me to chair this very important conference. The second Africa Bible and Christianity Seminar. It's a great joy because the Bible is very important to us who are Africans. It is true that we hear God speak to us and it is true that we have Christianity. The Bible makes us to know God loves the world. The Bible makes us know how my God loves the world, especially we Africans. And therefore, we don't see the Bible as a strange book, but we see it as God's own book to us. And therefore, Jesus is no stranger to us. So it's a great delight. And I think that this conference or seminar will benefit all of us to reaffirm the fact that Christianity is a world religion. It's one that is meant for all. So it's a great honor and I gladly accept to chair today's proceedings. Let me just now move on to introduce the speaker in the person of the most reverend Dr. Abaji Mensa. I've known him for more than 30 years. First, as my lecturer, and my mentor. You know, in Trinity College, we say so we're some of the lecturers who just, who just taught us, but others were those who be, were like our mentors. We looked up and we wanted to be like them because they challenged us and they led exemplary lives. And he was one of such. And we have been friends since then. The Reverend Dr. Abaji Mansa is a, a very important figure when you talk of Christianity in Ghana. In the evangelical circles, he's a, a very renowned leader, but he's also a scholar, a very important 
figure in this nation. Once the presiding bishop of the Methodist Church of Ghana. And in many areas, God has used him to touch so many lives. So he's not just a scholar who has written so many books, but he's somebody who cares about the quality of Christianity in our country, especially when he used to teach us about ethics. So he's a married man with two grown children, Yekuya and Kwame, and how many grandchildren? Three grandchildren. So, <laughs> so I just want to say, Papa, we are very grateful that you have accepted to speak to us, and we are ready to hear what God has for you, for us today. And those of you online, we welcome all of you, and we hope that you listen attentively. We will listen to the lecture. So take note of any question that you have. There will be time for us to ask questions, and then we'll get some responses. So our speaker, the most reverend, Rev, uh, the most reverend Dr. Abwaji Mensah. I'm very grateful for the invitation from ACI, Akrofi Christella uh, Institute, to be part of this series of lectures. Um, as you said, I, some of us have been with Akrofi Christella since the time of our dear brother Kwame Bidiaku. In, in, in actually, it was when we were students together at the, when we were students together at uh, Aberdeen, University of Aberdeen, then the whole idea of setting up a center like this came up, and I myself being a Methodist, I was also thinking that the Methodists would also set up a center. That's another story. So as soon as we came back after our lecture uh, studies, uh, Kwame invited me to be part right from the beginning in the formation of this place. So I'm very grateful for Kwame and uh, our sister Mary uh, for the opportunity. And today we are here uh, to be part of what is going on. So thank you very much those who are organizing this, uh, Rudolf Gezi and the others. We cannot mention all the names, Prof. Uh, now we have about two, three of the props, so thank you very much. These were my old students and now. The theme that we want to look at this morning for our discussion, for our lecture and so on is the presence of Africa and Africans in the Bible. The presence of Africa and Africans in the Bible. And I think this is something that we really would need to uh, do. Uh, for some reason, some people think that Africa came to know about the God in the Bible when the Europeans missionaries came and all that. I'm hoping that as we go through this course, you realize that our contact with, as Africans, with the Jews goes far back, or the people of God, right? Old Testament, and also in the New Testament, the African, the, pre, the, the presence of Africa and Africans in the Bible. That's what we're going to look at. Uh, so we will, I will try and focus on some biblical narratives and some poetry on Africa and Africans that are found in the Bible, both in the old, especially in the Old Testament. For instance, the narratives will start from the pre patriarchal that's it, before the church fathers, uh, like Abraham, and then the Abraham's time, and also in the wilderness journey. And then we may, if the time allows, look at some prophetic writings uh, in the study. Also, we will look at some parts in the New Testament that talks about African and Africans and so on. So let's, without wasting much time, let's go on uh, with, with it, our study. The first thing I want us to take note of, later on if you are interested in knowing some of the 
books that will be relevant for you to read more about what we are going to let and know. ACI will make sure that we can get a copy of this course uh, uh, that I'm giving or this lecture or that we are looking at. I have a list of the bibliography, a list of them that will be of help to you and to all, all of us. Now, the first thing I want us to look at as a part of the introduction is the, this, what I've entitled as the subtle de-Africanization of Africa and Africans in the biblical scholarship. Let me read. That's the, the subtle Africanization of Africa and Africans in biblical scholarship. What do we mean here is that sometimes when we, we hear about Christianity and Africa, we, some of us are made to feel that the Africans only heard about God who created the heaven and earth when the Europeans came uh, to, to bring the gospel to Africa and so on. What we want to say here is that indeed, we Africans have been part of what God was doing right from the beginning, uh, especially when we take our Bibles and read them correctly as we have to. So they, we have been as Africans in contact with God who created heaven and earth long before even the, uh, the New Testament period. So we have spent some time in the Old Testament to see that Africans have been present even in the Old Testament. And then look at that Africans also were present in the New Testament. And therefore, not surprising that the, church, the Christianity had been in Africa and are still in Africa. That's a very important issue that I want us to look at. So the first is, what are some of the subtle ways in which people have tried to give the impression as if Africa did not even exist until Europeans uh, came to us. And here too, I have a long list of things that I hope in future you'll be able uh, to read. The first uh, thing, um, the various introduction to the Old Testament and the histories of the Israel, especially the sections that are dealing with the geography of the Mesopotamian, and the ancient Near East subtly try to exclude Africa. The impression that is created in these studies is that Africa and African people have no play in the history of ancient Israel. Even where reference is made to Egypt, one is made to believe that Egypt is part of Near East and not of Africa. For, for example, uh, there are some, a list of books that I can give you, find time and read through some of them. The Ronald E. Clements book, 100 Years of Old Testament Interpretation, uh, that is published in 1976. There we have the uh, Douglas A. Knights and Jenny M. Tucker editing the Hebrew Bible and, the, and its modern uh, interpreters, also 1985. Now we have Norman C. Godwell, the Hebrew Bible, a socio-literary introduction that was also published in 1985, and so on. There's a, quite a list of them as I say later on, if you want to know more about this. Uh, if you contact Akrofi Crystalla, you can get a copy of my lecture notes on this list. In all these pages, we are made to feel, they talk about Near East and the way Africa is missing. And as I said, even when Egypt is mentioned, maybe Egypt is not made to feel that it's part of Africa, but it's part of Near East and Mesopotamia. And that's some of the a subtle way in which. The same tendency of de-Africanization is also seen in the maps. If you take some of the maps, the Bible lands, maps about the Bible lands. 
most maps either show only Syria dash Palestine or that the region and areas in the east they will put it. If there is any depiction of Africa, it is surely restricted to Egypt. And this was especially the case in the 18th and the 19th centuries. Uh, the maps that actually came out during that period purported to depict, quote, all the places named in the Bible, end of quote. But that often omitted African nations of Kush, of Put, of Sarini, and the like. So even the maps, do take time and go through some of the maps that are given in those during that period about Africa, uh, about the Bible and so on. Africa doesn't seem to mean. And even where, in cases where uh, Egypt is mentioned, Egypt is made to be part of Near East and not part of Africa. That's the point that we are making. In the modern maps, the de-Africanization takes place in presenting a map labeled the Near East. So I'm to repeat myself here. These maps include African territories and thereby suggesting that there are not to be considered part of Africa, African continent, but a Near East, but rather part of Near East. Sorry to repeat myself, and I want to repeat it as a matter of emphasis. See, for example, we have Oxford Bible Atlas. If you look at pages 54 to 55, page 92 to 93, all these maps look at make it in Egypt like be part of the Near East, not Africa. But thank God, there is one exception. One exception to the modern cartographic de-Africanization is the map that is found in the inside, inside cover of Bernard Anderson's Understanding the Old Testament. This which was uh, the fourth edi edition of that book, published in 1986, which not only does this one locate Kush in Africa, but also labels the whole continent, including Egypt, as Africa. And so that's so important. We want to later on take more note of all that. There are those also who want to move Egypt from Africa by depicting Egyptians as if they are Westerners. They are from the West. See, for example, the image of the book, the image of the black in the Western art, volume one. The image of the black in the Western art, volume one. Here, attempts are made to show that ancient Egypt should be considered Western, Western Europe. And that the existence of blacks or Africans in ancient Egypt is unusual. Take, these are some of the documents I've given you. Another example of this minimizing tendency is seen in the Hubert Hoffman's article on Egypt in the Harper's Bible Dictionary. In this, Hoffman admits that Egypt is in Africa, but then goes on to claim that, quote, Egyptian cultural influence on Palestine was modest, of course. Remember, the Israel had lived in Israel uh, in Egypt for how many years? And the influence was. I will come. We we'll see that from the Bible is not minimal at all. So there are some church historians also and theologians who also attempt to de-Africanize Egypt. Such scholars treat the Alexandrian and the other Northern Africa churches 
as a subunit of Western Church. For example, just to earn L. Gonazles, uh, there is a, 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 a history of Christian thought published in 1970. So you find it's trying to come out with this kind of issue that you really enjoyed reading through to put things right. The whole basis of the idea of the fertile crescent as the cradle of civilization that extends from Egypt around and through Syria and Palestine and on to the Tigris River appears to be an attempt to claim Egypt is not part of Africa, but is part of the West. So, in short, this section, what we say, is that in these, for these reasons and more, there is the need for us to go to the Bible itself and find out what the Bible says in both Old Testament and the New Testament about Africa and the Africans and the role they played. Because we all believe that the word of God is something that we need to take seriously. And so if we hear what the word of God says about Africa and Africans, then we will know where we stand on this matter. So our, stay, our talk hopefully will, will, will help us to correct previous distortions and omissions in scholarship. I'm talking about scholarship. There are two questions at least that we hope to respond to. First, what do the references ancient African nations and indigi individuals tell us about how ancient Israel perceived Africans or blacks? Secondly, how do these perceptions help us to understand better the significant roles that these Africans played in the Bible? So the first thing, this has been a long introduction, but it's worth it. The third, next point, main point we want to look at is the Old Testament narratives or Old Testament passages on the presence of Africa and Africans in the Bible. So we want to have our Bibles with us. Wherever you are, kindly take your Bible. and We will try and go through some passages in the scripture and that will help us. Now, one of the interesting things in it, the passage that I want us to look at is Genesis chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. Genesis chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. Let me read. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what a, his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will, be, will he be to his brothers. And he, said, he also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend the territory of Japheth. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be his slave. And after the flood, Noah lived 100 and 350 years. And altogether, Noah lived 150, 950 years. And then he died. What is it we want to look at it in this passage? The important thing is that, note here, I'll come back later and explain, the Kushites and the so on are the blacks. But the one who was cursed in this passage is Canaan, not the Kush. If you come... <laughs> Not, 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 the, not the Kush. There's Ham's Peter were Kush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. 
we find in this teaching the Kush are the blacks and the Mizraim and the Put, but Canaan was not. And what is interesting is that, especially during the apartheid system, this passage was used to say that the whites have come to Africa to take over because they are under curse and they use a passage by Canaan. But the place, those who, the one who was cursed, was not a Kush. That's the point I want to make. Was not a mystery, was not put. And later on, the Lord will ask Israel to take over Canaan. But that is another story that we are not going to get in. The point we are making here is that from the biblical record, the one who was cursed was not the black, was not the Kushites. They were not the Muslim. They were not the put. And so if you were to study your scriptures very well, you would not go to use this to support the fact that Africans were, God cursed them to be slaves. It isn't. Take note of that. It is not all the children of Ham that were under the case. It was particularly taken as Canaan, and we are not Canaanites in that sense, as Africans. That's one important point I want us to note about this. Now let's look at the, the table of nations that I've also found uh, in Genesis chapters 10, uh, chapter 10, 1 to 32. Because of time, we will not be able to go through all that. It's a long list. I want you to take time and read that also. The text gives us an account of Noah's sons, that the Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their children. Our focus here will be uh, 10, 6. Uh, look at chapter 10, 6 to 20. Let me start with 6. The sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Sheba, Havila, Sapta, Rama, and Saptika. And then the sons of Rama, it goes on Sheba and so on. And take note of verse 8. Cush, that is the, the Cush means the black, dark skinned people or the Africans. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who grew up to be a mighty warrior on earth. He wasn't a weak person, the Cush and his family. They grew up to a mighty warrior on earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and that is why it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. And the first centers, uh, the first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Erek, Akkad, and and then in Shina and so on. And from that land he went to Assyria where he built Nineveh and so on. So these are the Cushites. Looking later about the biblical story about them. They were not a mean kind of people. They were strong and powerful. So that's one of the images of, that we can. I wish there is time to point out more about this, but uh, time will not permit us. No, we also know about Abraham was in Egypt, and later he had sons. Uh, Hagar, uh, with Hagar, he had a son with Hagar. We, may know, we know about that. Ishmael out of whom now some Muslims would trace their roots. That's an African. And take note about this. I'm going to go on to that from here. How the early people like Abraham and those who followed him, and later on will come about Joseph and Moses and Solomon will be attracted by African ladies and so on. I will come to that very soon. So the point we want to make is that Abraham himself had a child with an African lady. 
and Ishmael, the first child. They narrate there are also in Egypt, Joseph. When Joseph got married, she got married to Asenath, Egyptian lady, the daughter of Potiphar, an Egyptian priest of On, and her two sons with him, Manasseh and Ephraim. If you read Genesis 41, 44 to 45, and then 46, 19. Later on, you will see that you may understand that these children, the fact that the Joseph's wife, in those days, those who were living in Egypt were not Arabs. They were Africans, Kushites, and so on. So the lady that Joseph married was an African lady and had African Jewish child, uh, children with them. I'll come back to Ephraim and others later. Jeroboam, an Ephraimite, one of Solomon, uh, you remember the Jeroboam, the issue between Jeroboam and uh, Rehoboam. And when there was a controversy, where did Jeroboam run to? For uh, where? To Egypt, if you read through the scriptures. He's going back to his grandparents for protection and care. Why, when they wanted to get him and kill them and so on. He was an Ephraimite, and the Ephraimites have their roots in Ephraim. And so when the trouble came, he ran back to Africa for protection, as most people go to Africa for protection. Even Jesus had to be taken to Africa for protection. Hello? Hi. That is the truth about what the scripture is saying. Uh, here. <laughs> So that was when he was one of the Solomon's officials who disagreed with Solomon. And when Solomon wanted to get him, he ran back to his uh, country, to Egypt, because Solomon tried to kill him. And he found that going back home would be a way of taking care of himself. And as I said, after him, many people would run to Africa for protection, even including Jesus himself. Moses was born in Egypt. And then he also later got married to an African woman who belonged to the royal family. Uh, we know that Egypt, uh, Moses belonged to the royal family of Pharaoh due to whether adoption or whatever we may describe that. And had an Egyptian education Take note of this. It is this ed Egyptian education that was given to him, to Moses, that he was able to write the first books in the Bible. His training and preparation in the e uh, Egypt knowledge and so on and skills enabled him to write when the Lord eventually asked him, to lead the people of Israel. And that is a major, you won't say that is a minor contribution, African contribution. The African teaching given to Moses brought him to that point that he was able to write. His educational standard was high enough for him to write the five books of Moses. That is Genesis to Deuteronomy. Moses also with Egyptian identity got married to Zipporah, a Kushite, an African lady. There are some commentators who are trying to push Kush in somewhere outside Africa. Uh, and some argument in some of the uh, commentaries, there's no time for me to go into that. Uh, instead of accepting that uh, Moses' wife was an African, was a black, a Kushite, in Africa, they tried to push, okay, yeah, yeah, it was a push, but not in Africa. Why, why all that trouble? 
a Cushite, the daughter of Jethro, the priest, and her children were there, as we know. So these are very interesting. Lepron will want to read uh, Exodus 2, chapter 21 to 22, Numbers, I'll come back to Numbers 12, 1 to 16. Uh, very, now, in Numbers 12, let's turn to that very quickly. Uh, for, because it's important for us. Some of us may not find time later on to read anything about that. And the Numbers 12. Numbers chapter 12. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife. For he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? They asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now, Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. At once, the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When both of them stepped forward, he said, listen to me, listen to my words. And then the story goes on. You may want to read through and how the anger of God came upon them, the way they more or less seem to disagree with their brother marrying an African. And take note here, and I want to stress this. It's not that they were that he was marrying somebody who had a mean kind of at all. In fact, it is the other way around. In those days, the Egyptians and the background of people that we are talking about were high class. And so some of them were uh, Miriam and uh, his brother was wondering why if you want to marry, why not one from our own and you take somebody higher than all of us. In those days, the Kushites were not like the uh, American the racism has put us. So that was one of the complaints. Why take somebody a little higher than all of us uh, to, to marry? And uh, not take on just one of your own people. But Moses, God has led him to do what he has to do. And he did the right thing. Because he felt that what God wanted him to do. And what God wants us to do is the right. Whether we agree with God or not is another story. So here we have Zipporah getting married. And note again, Joseph got to marry to an African woman. You remember when I? Joseph will come to that. Moses is also getting married to an African woman. Later on, we'll come to that very soon. Solomon, first wife, is also be an African woman. What are all these telling us? I need to cut things short, otherwise, because of time. What we are actually saying here is that the African presence in terms of the African blood ran, started running through the Israelite blood together right from the time of Abraham to Joseph. Moses and Solomon's first wife also was an African. So our African presence in the people chosen by God as people of Israel that is not start at the time when missionaries came to Africa. They were not all like all of were not even born right the time in the Old Testament period. And that's very important. Uh, I wish I could go on and what I've said. Some, later on, if you, you, you read First Kings, 
uh, chapter 3, 1 to 2. That's where you talk about uh, Solomon getting his first wife and so on. Uh, note that in First Kings chapter 2, verse 46 B, the marriage came at a time, quote, the kingdom was now firmly established in Solomon's hand after the death of Shemel. The impression is that the marriage is one of the first major official acts of the King Solomon. And when he looked around, he did not find any to choose for his first wife than an African lady. I think the African lady distracted these Jewish people, you know. The second thing that follows after the marriage is that is a, a, a story that affirms the military might of the king of Egypt. They were not small people those days, the king of Egypt. If you read 1 Kings 9, 16, Pharaoh gave a conquered territory to Solomon as part of his daughter's dowry. A great, powerful people. The thing that worth mentioning too, is that Solomon's marriage to the Egyptian illustrates his wealth and building activities. And fourthly, the marriage to the daughter of Egyptian Pharaoh begins the list of his foreign wives. And the first on the, that list is no other than an African lady from Pharaoh's lineage. We may not be wrong in claiming that Solomon's marriage to an Egyptian princess might have raised his esteem through such an association. He might have even adopted some of the governing practices of the Egyptians that strengthened the political alliance between the two nations. And as Bailey has suggested, through this intermarriage, Solomon took, quote, the Egyptian governing model and perfected it. In other words, he can play their game better than they, end of quote from Bailey. So the marriage was an example of Solomon's diplomatic genius of how he can get these great African kings and so on this side to fulfill his ministry if God has called in him. So Solomon and the Queen of Sheba too, you know, an African lady whom he got together. And how much that also helped Solomon. And as I won't get time to go, time will not permit us. You know that up to today, the problem is there. Some of the Africans that the uh, Solomon and uh, Shape had the relationship they had, the children that were born, and so on. Some of them in, uh, in Ethiopia had to go, now are settled in Israel. The conflict is still there. It started long ago. The truth is still also here with us. So the narrative also demonstrates that the motive of the wealthy African, the queen, comes, we, we are told, a very great Retinue with camels, bearing spices, very much gold, precious stones that this queen brought. It's not in a, a poor country, a poor continent. Right from there, it was not poor. Up to today, they are still craving for whatever we have. And find all kinds of means they can take even the little that is left after they've taken much away. So the African presence as a Kushite during the period of judges is also another important thing that we need to know. There will not be time for me to go into that. Let us read Judges chapter 3, 7 to 10, and then First Chronicles 2, 34, and so on. Uh, another, there's also African presence during the time of the uh, United Monarchy. There are four references that indicate African or black presence during the period of the United Monarchy. We have, for instance, the account of Hakushi, 
the Cushite in 2 Samuel 18. Read that later on. We had the text which with reference to the color of the maiden in the songs, the song of songs, in the song of songs, chapter 1, uh, 5, and 6, and 13. There's also the African presence in the narrative within the books of First and Second Kings and in the prophetic, uh, prophetical books of Amos and Hosea. Uh, the reference are uh, in events and oracles that pertain to Egypt and Ethiopia. For example, the invasion of Judah by Shishak, Pharaoh of Egypt. And according to Chronicles, his army included Libyans, Sukin, and Ethiopians. All these are Africans who supported his in fighting. And during the reign of King Asa, Judah was invaded by Zerah, the Ethiopian. In Amos 9-7, the prophet compared the people of Israel with the Ethiopians, declaring that they are equal in the sight of Yahweh. Note that in the times that Amos lived and afterwards, the Ethiopians were known as people of renown. Even Hosea, the prophet, criticized Israel for depending upon Egypt as also upon Assyria instead of depending upon the Lord because they saw the might of the Africans in there. Then you can read this in Hosea uh, 7, 11, following 9, uh, chapter 9, 3, following, and chapter 11, 1, 12, and so on. So according to 2 Kings 17, 4, during the period that Hosea prophesied, King Hoshea of Israel sent to So of Egypt for help. So Africans were helping the Egyptians. And during the reign of King Hezekiah, and the time of the prophet Isaiah, remember the Ethiopia or the Egypt uh, participated in the affairs of Judah. Isaiah chapters 18 and 19 and 20 are uh, prophecies against Ethiopia and Egypt. They are, they are oracles of doom as well as oracles that predict that the Egyptians will one day become worshippers of Israel's God, along with Israel and Assyria. And uh, Isaiah 30 and 31 concern, uh, concern Egypt during the uh, the period of the Ethiopian rule. In these, the prophet castigates Judah for relying upon a military strength of Egypt instead of upon Yahweh, as I've just said. A similar thought is also expressed in the speech of the Assyrian Rashba, as you, you may find in Isaiah 36, for following 2 Kings 8, 19. So again, during the reign of King Hezekiah, reference is made to the coming of Pharaoh Tilhaka, a Cushite, during Sennacherib's seize of Jerusalem. Let me turn, let's turn quickly to this and just for the reference. Isaiah 37, Isaiah uh, chapter 37, and verse 9, Isaiah 37. Isaiah 37, verse 9. Let's see what is there. Now, Sennacherib received a report that Tilhaki the Cushite king of Egypt was marching out to fight against him. And when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah with this word. Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on 
deceive you when he says Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. Surely you have heard what the king of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely, and will you be delivered? Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my forefathers deliver them? The gods of Kozan, Haran, uh, Resef, and the people of Eden who were in Tel Azar? Where is the king of Hamad, the king of, Af the, king of the city of Sepharim, or the Hena, or Eva? And as you read the story, Hezekiah then tamed and prayed and so on. And the person that God used that made Hezekiah stop, uh, sorry, the Sennacherib stop going to take Jerusalem was that he hears that this king, this uh, Egyptian uh, king was going to take over Assyria. And so he had to stop attacking Jerusalem and run to Assyria. And then he was killed by his own sons. This pharaoh, Tilhak, was used by God. An African, a Kushite, to make that possible. I wish there is time for us to go on, but let me see if we can. Uh, one other interesting thing is, uh, let's turn to uh, Zephaniah, the book Zephaniah, and, who, who, and see who this man is. Who is Zephaniah? This uh, Who is Sephaniah? Who is Sephaniah? Chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Sephaniah, son of Cush. African. The son of Gedaliah, the son of Maria, the son of Hezekiah, uh, during the reign of of Josiah, son of Amon. Can you see the list there? That this African, one of the prophets that were used by God. When you read through the book of Zephaniah, you are talking about an African. So Africans came to know this God long before Europeans came to Africa. In the Old Testament time we are talking, not New Testament. It's in the Old Testament time that we are talking about. Not the New Testament. And I wish uh, the time of Jeremiah, too, we have the same, uh, someone who helped, who was working very much with the king of Israel in those days and helped to save Jeremiah when he was put in the, they put him in, 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 uh, in the well or pit. No, he also was a Kushite, Ebed Melek. Ebed Melek. He's the one in the, fam the royal family who went and said, Hey, what, is, what are you doing? This man that you put there is a guy. If you don't get him out, we will be in trouble. He's a man of God. Whatever he said, you have to listen. And we know the story how they went and eventually took Jeremiah out of that pit. It was an African who was used by God, who was working in the, in the palace, who was used by God to make sure that Jeremiah didn't die inside that pit. He was called Ebed Melek, a Kushite, an official in the Judahite court who was instrumental in saving Jeremiah's life and interestingly afterwards what happened to him he was blessed God said he should be blessed let us read Jeremiah 38 7 to 9 find time and read Jeremiah 38 7 to 9 and Jeremiah 39 15 to 18 
Jeremiah 38, 7 to 13, and Jeremiah 39, 15 to 18. Again, in Jeremiah 41 to 43, 8, an expansion of 2 Kings 5, 25, 26, is an account of a group of Judahites who fled to Egypt, taking Jeremiah with them uh, against his will and taking up the residence in uh, Tachpanis and so on. So there are several references in the book of Ezekiel also that talk about Africans. Time will not permit me to go into that. The next passage also that, that I want to quickly to point out to is some of the poetic passages in the prophetic writings, the Psalms and the wisdom lit literature that mention African nations such as Egypt, Kush, Sheba, and Ethiopia. For, ranks, for example, the passages like Hosea 7, 11, Isaiah 31 to 2, 31, 1 to 3, and Ezekiel 29, 16, Ezekiel 30, 13 to 19. In some of these passages, the African nations are treated in some positive ways. For instance, Israel trusting these nations for their military um, and their uh, political powers. And secondly, the passage speaks of African nations in terms of their wealth. And thirdly, along with their wealth, these African nations were respected for their wisdom. For example, one of the oracles against Egypt in Isaiah 19, 11 to 15, read that later on. Fourthly, these poetic passages speak about these African nations in terms of their being the norm for valuation. For example, in Amos 9.17, where God declares, and I quote, are not you Israelites the same as the Cushites? Are not you Israelites the same as the Cushites. It is important to point out that at the time that Amos was speaking, Cush was in control of Egypt. And what was major, what was the major political and uh, military force in the region? Thus the statement must be understood as a positive reference to Cush. And let me say, a similar passage is, is Jeremiah's famous set for rhetorical questions in her Jeremiah 13 to 23. And now here I like Rathaus uh, Bailey's translation of the text from the Hebrew language, where he begins with a sentence that sentence with would instead of can, as translated by some of them. What do we mean? Would the Kushite change his skin or the leopard his spots? So also you have learned to do evil so that, sorry, so also you who have learned to do evil could do good? Note here. Some of the translations say, can the Kushite change his skin? No, 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 no. As if he wants to change his skin. Would he do it? And the answer is no. In the same way that uh, uh, you, uh, a, a leopard will not destroy its uh, punk because that is where the power is. In the same way, the Kushite will not change his skin. Some of you who want to change your skin <laughs> and look like a white people, now think about that. Would you do that? The answer is no. But they, some of the translation now they say can, as if he wants to do it, but he cannot do it. No. The Hebrew translation would is better than can. And so when you're reading it, you read there, would the Kushai change his skin? In the same way, would a leopard also change his spots? And the answer is no, because he's happy with that. 
Praise the Lord. So Benny explains that the Hebrew uses he interrogative with the imperfect. That is H Y H P K. Uh, there's no time for me to go into that. Let me quickly come to the New Testament. If I have five more minutes, so. The New Testament, I wish I could, we could do. In conclusion, then, from the Old Testament passage, it is clear that what has been stated above, that Africans not only have a, a presence in the Israelite, the Israelite poetic and narrative materials, indeed, those materials show that Israel held African nations and individuals in a very high regard. These African nations symbolized military might, political stability, and wealth. The wisdom, their wisdom was highly regarded. The Old Testament. Briefly, the African Africans in the New Testament mean the first one I want to look at, the conversion of the Egyptian finance minister. That one I can spend the whole time on that for another lecture, recently gave one on that. The Canaanite, uh, the, this, uh, the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch, though interesting, the note, the word Ethiopian means dark skinned. So this, the Ethiopian eunuch we are talking about here actually was in somewhere in Sudan, South, North Sudan today, when he went into Jerusalem. And remember that when you read the text, what Jesus told the disciples is that in the same way that he himself did, they will start from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then to the Artemis. And note, they, when the gospel is to reach to the Artemis, the first pe person who received the gospel to take it to Africa was this Ethiopian eunuch. And actually, the story, as we got, he actually helped that lady who was in charge to be converted. And after all, he went to Asia to preach the gospel. It was in Ceylon that he preached and he was martyred this Ethiopian eunuch. So the Africans there, the finance minister of Enoch gets the gospel, hears it, believes, and he's sent out as the one who takes the gospel to other nations as well as Africa. That tells you that Christianity had been in Africa long, 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 long time before Europeans came. 500 years in a before uh, we in West Africa begin to, that the gospel has been there. So when you read your history and think, take note, there's all the African present in the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, there were Africans there. Read through the text from Egypt and all. Even if they be Jews, the Jews have been being influenced by the African thought. And so the African presence is there too. Now some of the... Uh, Christians who evangelized the people in Antioch were also from Sereni. Sereni is the North Africa. And remember, in uh, Acts chapter 13, those who were sent out, can we, uh, who placed their hands on Paul and uh, let's, uh, Acts chapter 13, in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called nigger, Simeon called black. Eh? Did you hear me? And Lucius of Sarini. Sarini too is in Africa. And Emmanuel and so on. And these are the ones who laid hands on... Uh, Paul and Barnabas, and two of them at least, were Africans who laid hands on them. 
prayed for them, and they went, and their ministry was very successful. So it is not in 12th century, 13th, whatever. Eh? We've been there long before in the Old Testament and in the New. Not surprising that in all the African countries, we don't have a concept of God, G-O-D-S, like Europe. In all African countries was a concept of one God who made the heavens and the earth. Why the Europeans will have so many gods they didn't, couldn't count them. Those are in the scriptures. So some of the Christians who also evangelized the people in Antioch, as I say, they were also, some of them were Africans from Sarini in North Africa, Sarini, a Libyan city in North Africa, west of Egypt, those days were not uh, Arabs who were living there. The Arabs came in the 6th something AD. Africans. Sarini was colonized by the Greeks in 603 BC. Among the distinguished citizens was a uh, one called Kanesilko, uh, Kan, uh, Kaniakos, the founder of the new academy at Athens, and also the Ar Aristippus, the Ep Epicurean philosopher and the friend of Socrates, also came from that city, from Serene. They were, they were trained, Africa. Interesting, I've been reading these recent days, the impact that Africa had on China. When they went there and found the pyramids that we have built, they went to China, started building them learn from the Africans. Hello? Well, time will not permit us to go into all that. A native of Serene, Simon by name, was impressed by the Roman soldiers into carrying the cross he, he, uh, of Jesus Christ. Thus, did Simon immortalize that city. There were also representatives of present in Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost from Africa. The Jewish population war warranted a synagogue. Lucius of Sarene is also mentioned in Acts 11, 19 to 20. Archaeology has shown that it was the Greek plan to make it the Athens of Africa. The leadership of the church in Antioch included prophets and teachers. Two of them, as I've said, uh, Africans mentioned in the passage, Simeon, who was uh, the black, and also the one that Lucius of Sarini. And note this, in Romans chapter 16, 13, when you read about Rufus, he's probably one of the two sons of Simon of Sarini the African who assisted Jesus in carrying out his cross. His other brother was called Alexander, as you find from Mark chapter 15, verse 21. John Mark, though a Jew, know this, was born in Africa. And he was the one, actually, when the disciples scattered John came to Egypt, ministered, and there he was killed. And the church began since then in Africa up to today. So my brothers and sisters, my conclusion in all this is that Africa and Africans, we have been in the Bible a long time. So those who have an idea that Christianity is a white man's religion, you don't understand your history, you don't understand the scriptures. We have been there a long time and we are still in that. And I pray that at in some places the center of gravity of Christianity is shifting and it's now coming to Africa, we will maintain that our old roots from the Old Testament, New Testament, and to the present. 
Thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, uh, so maybe if we want to make a comment, but let me just give chance to um, Jonas, Bishop Jonas Martinson. Bishop, you have the floor. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's good to see you again. <laughs> yeah. And uh, also, the explanation, particularly the last comment that was made regarding LGBT and the rest. Now, my question is that uh, you have indicated strongly the roots of African Christians before European Christianity in Africa. Yes. And then also, I hear about you mentioning about we believe in God. Believe. Mm -hmm. Now, this concept of we believe in God, in my opinion, sometimes compromises the that both Jews and Gentiles have sinned against God, an argument that Paul pushed out very well in the book of Romans. Find time and read through the whole of Paul's letter to Romans, where he suddenly come to the agreement that there were some Gentiles, there were some Jews Jew, who knew about but not the question of the salvation that Lord God has brought through Christ Jesus. So you, we may have a concept of one God, but that not necessarily mean that we have committed ourselves to this God and know that he has come, he has died for our sins, he has been raised from the dead, and now he gives us a new life. And that's what makes Christianity different from, uh, say, uh, Judaism and also in Islamic religion and so on. So the first thing is that believe in that there is one God is that it's not enough so far as Christians are concerned. But the fact that this one God came in the person of Jesus Christ, gave his life to us and died for our sins, we indeed crucified him with the African helping him to carry his cross. And then he he was raised to the and now we believe in him. And anyone who believes in him as Lord and Savior, therefore, will have salvation. And that's what makes the Christianity different from the other religions. Now the question is whether the African Christian theology. Uh, I hope you will look around now. In these days, a lot of books have been written by Africans about their theological experience. In fact, where we are now, and we are having this talk, a Kofi Christella Institute, was started by an African who initially, Kwame Bedia, who initially didn't know the Lord Jesus, even though he was a Presbyterian, and then later on came to know Christ and had his life transformed. And as a result of that, eventually led to the establishment of a Kofi Christella 
Institute, of which some, we are still there. That time, two of us were studying in Aberdeen uh, University when the idea came up, as I said in the talk. And so we must, there are African theology, theologians who have written quite a lot of this. Kindly of look for some of those books, and I, you also make your own contribution. If you have something about what it means to be an African, an African theologian, please write for all of us to listen and see how your writing will help us to grow in our faith in Christ Jesus. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any more questions? Yes, Jonas, you want to make a follow-up? Okay, Jonas, you yes, want to make a follow-up? Please. Yes, but uh, I, I, we are talking about a very serious problem in England now. Where the cause of the Because of it's gone. It's cut, been cut off. Misled by the Western, it's a very serious uh, situation where people are saying now that they identify with the Israelites to become the original bearers of the Bible and advocates of the Christian gospel. Now. So we have uh, many young people in the diaspora at the moment because we have been emphasizing the fact that we are also, we, we were part of Christianity and the Europeans have misled us in one way or the other. We are having a very big battle as which we need to defend. I'll be very grateful with your experience, you will be able to say something that will correct the impression that unless the African become an Israelite, it is not a question. Uh, one of the most interesting things that I heard was that Ghana is the only one place in Israel where the threatens it. And therefore, Ghana are the Israelites and we are the only people God came to see. <laughs> and all because there is this confusion, this kind of war between Black Christians and um, European Christians. So, Professor, with your experience and thought, is this something that you can help us to address so that we can a problem in the diaspora of the world? Uh, the first thing I want us to know, and I said it in my lecture, that Christianity is not a European religion. And so we need to understand. <laughs> We need to understand that very much well. Christianity is not a European religion. Europe was introduced to the Christian religion. Before, before Christianity got to Europe, that is the 313 uh, AD, when Constantine declared uh, Rome, Roman Empire as Christian, Europeans did not have a belief in one God. And they struggled with that and fought against the whole idea of saying that there is one God who has come and so on. And interestingly, if you know something about your theology, one of the persons who helped the church, the people who helped the church to develop strongly the idea of the Trinity, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, were African theologians. Africans who have come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and found that this Jesus was sent by the Son and that through the Holy Spirit the message had come and that there is only one God that we know, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Athanasius and others were the ones who argued strongly and make the whole question of the Trinity come back. So again, Christianity has been with us in Africa. It was these people, these Africans, their theological thinking and reflection that in fact impacted uh, Europe. Augustine and others who went there to the missionaries and so on. So I want to stress again, Christianity is not is not N-O-N-Capital 
O capital, T capital, bold, underlined, italics. Eh? Christianity is not a European religion. They accepted it. Now some of them don't want it and say they are going back to their old tradition. Again, note that Islam Judaism is not so not a Christian faith. But that should, shouldn't have been the case. Because not all the people in Israel, even in Jesus' time, accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Otherwise, he would not have been crucified. And this is what makes Christianity very distinct from other religions. In Christianity, we accept that Yahweh, who created the heaven and the earth, through all his son Jesus Christ, the working of the Holy Spirit, came into this life to redeem us from sin, from death, and to give us a new life. And that whether you are a Jew or you are uh, a non-Jew, as the book of Romans, take time and read Paul's letter to the Romans. Both Gentiles and Jews, there's only one way by which we all can be saved throughout the world, so far the Christian coin, is faith in Christ Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. And that's what makes Christianity different. And so on. So, if our blacks, friends, you don't have to become a Jew to become an African Christian. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior as an African. Let the Jew believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Let the European believe in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And then we are all one people as Christians. And now we need to understand that. So don't be ashamed if you are, and say that you are an African Christian. You don't have to become a Jew. But that's what the Bible says. Take time and study the scriptures and you understand what I'm saying. I recommend highly Paul's letter to the Romans to you. Take time and study that one. Thank you very much. I hope I have been able to respond to your question. And I just to make a point that it's not me really personally, but it's the challenge we are facing in the diaspora. And yes. Uh, it's, it's, been, it's been a challenge because of the European context and how we have been emphasizing the fact that the Europeans have done this part. But what you are saying is very clear and true. And I, I, I thank the Lord for the clarification. Thank you. Because um, we, 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 it's one thing that I, I wanted to bring to a coffee for clarification to see what the academic paradigm is all about because we are faced with so many challenges, gay, lesbian, and all the rest. And now we are, our children and young people who are having to deal with becoming Israelites before they become, it's quite a serious thing. So it's very good that you have tackled this issue effectively and emphatically. Um, I will recommend, you to I will, sorry, I recommend that you study Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, eh? Yeah. Well, there was a debate like we were saying. The debate was whether if you are a Jew, uh, if you are a Gentile and become a Christian, you must become a Jew. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And the, the part of that discussion, the outcome is that no, remain a Jew or remain a Gentile. But what is important is your faith that is in the Lord Jesus Christ as the mm -hmm. one who has dealt with your sin and my sins and we are like, you don't have to become a Jew because there are some Jews who still do not even accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Today, there are some Jews who are arguing that even the Bible itself should be, if possible, taken away from Israel. You will get it, especially the New Testament. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Bishop. Um, we will now read some, uh, some comments from um, Dr. Yapebi. Osofu, thank you for the enlightening talk. The question is, what exactly is the problem with Africans such that it doesn't seem like we have the pro uh, propensity 
to write, write, write. Then he continues, I ask this question because much of what you have shared should not have been an issue, but for a certain inability or non-desire to read, research, and um, Okay. Uh, or, or not desire to read, research, and write. Uh, if you are there, you can, you can speak clearly so that um, um, Dr. Abaji Maisa can respond to you. Peggy, are you there? Yes, I am, but I think, I think the question is clear. This is what asking, why do we need to have research and write? What's the problem? What, what's the... The, the, as I said earlier, if I got you well, a lot of Africans have been writing uh, about their faith and so on. Kwame Bediaku is one of them. Uh, I wish I could share Kwame's testimony. Kwame Dibingo, who grew up in the Presbyterian Church, then later on went to all sorts of things, and then finally was confronted personally with the Lord Jesus Christ and gave himself, his life to Christ, and that life was changed. And then he felt that he will stop all that he's doing and set up an institute like this where the teaching of the Bible within the African context will be done so that Africans will know that this Jesus Christ is Lord of all, including Africans, Jews, Asians, uh, Europeans, and all. And that's why this institute is set up. So. We never, hey, please don't let anyone deceive you into thinking that you must become this dearful European or become a Jew before you can be a good African Christian. Be an African Christian, a good one to the glory of God. As I said in my lectures, there were Africans in the early church. They remained Africans. If you read Acts chapter 13, these Africans, two of them at least laid hands on uh, Paul and Barnabas when God was sending them out into the world to preach the gospel after the uh, before even the African uh, had become converted and taken the message to uh, Sudan you know and the church lasted in Sudan for about 500 years before uh, people coming to West Africa with Christianity and so on so please hold on to the Lord. You don't have to become any other group. Remain an African. And there has been a lot of, maybe, kindly look for right to a Kofi crystal here. Uh, they will give you a long list of Africans, including some of us who have been writing, writing books, writing articles, and so on. And then you hear us sharing our faith in our own African context. So kindly do that. There are those who are here, there are a lot of professors here uh, in this school who are Africans, did their PhD so in African context and so on. So please, my brother, connect, contact ACI uh, and then you know that your question had already been answered. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, oh, I am very interested to ACI. I have written myself a whole Good. If the position is that Africans read the set and write, then maybe what I'm saying that why don't we do it enough? It is certainly not enough. And especially at this time when Africa is in its Christian continent, numerically, if our people don't have a conviction that this faith is our, it's our own faith that we have come to know, then we cannot spread the gospel. We cannot do any use of the gospel going forward. Why don't you read research and write enough? Okay, thank you very much. We need something from you too. <laughs> I'm not waiting. I'll pick up to the left. Yes, thank you very much. Let us know more of your writing so that we will study them and enjoy things together, my friend. I'm so happy to hear from you that way. And we don't need to hear more about you. And then, but we are happy about this. 
that you, you are concerned. Because there are some people who still think that Africans have not been writing about their Christian faith and so on. But I want to say, thank God, a lot has been written. It's a question of finding where they are studying them and then helping that to help you too. And we thank you that you also have been writing. Let's, if the Kofi Christopher hasn't got copies of your work, let's have them here for our libraries. Uh, we'll be very grateful, sir. Yeah, yeah uh, we, we understand your concern. Uh, we, we need more, more, more writing. So it's a challenge to us to do more research, more reading, more writing. Uh, especially now that um, Christianity has shifted and the center is in Africa and the southern continent. We need to, to really show the way. So thank you for that comment. Thank you very much for this insightful uh, conversation on African Christians, the presence of Africa and Africans in the scriptures. The way you took us right from Genesis into the New Testament. I realized that Paul, Paul missionary journey was just in Turkey and Greece, more or less. And he made a comment that he didn't want to build on a foundation that someone has already built on. Could it be that Africa, the other side of the trailer, was already, work had already been done? And then this man comes to mind, Apollo. The scripture says that Luke said he was a native of Alexandria, well schooled. In Christ, we have accurate knowledge of Christ. But Priscilla said that he didn't have adequate ways of God, which they tried to bridge it. I was so intrigued, I was wondering to ask so, who brought the gospel to uh, Apollos? Uh, Luke said he was a, a learned man as well. Uh, if it's Mark, was it the same Mark that deserted Paul and Barnabas? Or another Mark? Um, and I found it so profound. Um, so if you can make comment on this, but Africa, what you have given us makes us proud to own Christ as Africans. And I know also that a number of evangelicals don't want to hear this. They say Christianity is Christianity. Don't bother our heads about Africans' niche. Um, what do you say to this? Yeah, well, you have said a lot now. And let me see. Apollos, uh, we not, uh, don't know exactly where he got come, but uh, Apollos might have come to know the Lord through maybe some of. John, Mark, and others who went there to preach. You know, when the disciples scattered uh, in the Acts, where there was a fight in Acts chapter 8, and they scattered, uh, partly later, it was John Mark, the one who wrote the, uh, the Gospel of Mark, is the one whom we are talking about. He came to... Uh, Africa, because he was living there. In fact, some argue that he was even born there, even though the parents were Jews. So when they scattered, that's where he came. And Matthew, we are told, also went to Ethiopia, the current Ethiopia. Huh? And the Ethiopian church, and in fact the church in Egypt, are the oldest churches in the world. They are all in Africa, not in Europe. So Christianity being in Africa is not just, again, stress when the Europeans in the 14th century, whatever century, that they came to West Africa and others. We have the roots of Christianity and even Islamic relations, as I've said, from the Old and the New Testament. It's been there. We've been part of that system for that long time. And it's very likely that maybe, maybe, I'm no, I don't know, in the time of uh, Marx, and maybe Apollos and others came to know the Lord. We don't know. But what we know, he had already got somewhere. And later on, 
he came to know clearly what it means to give his life to Christ and so on. Now the other is the, the evangelicals who don't want to hear about the fact of Africans uh, what having anything to do with the gospel that they don't hear the African Christianity. Why? Of course, in a sense, Christianity is not African, it's not European, it's not Jewish. Christianity is Christ. A faith that is committed to Christ. But wherever area of the world that we come from, the gospel tells us when we become, we believe in Jesus Christ, we don't reject our own cultural situation. We allow Christ to perform to transform those situations. In the same way that we believe in Christ and Christ transforms us personally, the society in which we live, Romans chapter 13 telling us, our work is for God to use us to transform the situations, the societies, the politics and the ways that we live in. Because the life of Christ touches not only individual life persons, but the community and society in which, and the cultures in which we live. And that is what is, is very important. Unfortunately, there are some of my, I'm an evangelical, there are some evangelicals who do not think about that the gospel has anything to do with society and changing society. It's me coming to know Christ, I'm going to heaven, whatever happened to the world, I don't care. That is not a proper evangelical belief. A proper evangelical belief is that you become, come to know the Lord. The Lord wants you to use you to transform the community where you live and the people that are with you. And therefore, be, don't be ashamed to uh, see yourself as an African evangelical, a European evangelical, or Jewish evangelical. But whatever turn you are, the center of is Christ Jesus and your faith in him and through the Holy Spirit transforming you into his image and his likeness. That is the point where Christianity is. So it doesn't matter which part of the world you are in and what kind of ethnic group you belong to. One message for all. I don't know whether there is a, he said something else that can be responded to. Yes. Paul and Barnabas. And Mark. And Mark. Yes, the same people. Barnabas was somehow related to Mark. I think he might, Mark must be his uh, nephew. Eh? Yeah. Uh huh. But their mother, the mother, the mother, Mark's mother was in Africa, living there, coming in and out. It was in their house, actually, that the Jesus and the disciples went and had their last uh, supper. Uh, that's my <laughs> speculation. Uh, in the impression we have from uh, Mark that he was a novice. He was a novice um, following Paul and Barnabas. Yeah, yeah, he was a young person. Yes, but if he's the same person who took the gospel to um, Egypt and he was killed there. Yes. So, uh, Paul says that he never wanted to build anything on any foundation, assuming that Egypt was already evangelized. So Paul did actually, you know, Paul didn't go to Egypt. Yes. Why? Because already there are some already there who are spreading the gospel. I think I will. So that's what, again, that's what you are saying. Paul then decided, you know, the scripture says he wanted to go to Asia, mm -hmm. and he strongly wanted to. With the Holy Spirit said, "No, go to Europe." Eh? Go to Europe. Okay. Macedonia is Europe. That's how the European mission, Ephesians, Ephesus, and others all started. So he started in Europe. Uh, the young man we talked about, or the eunuch of Ethiopia, actually in Africa when he came to Sudan, started a church there which was actually growing. Nubia and others. Eh? And not only there, as I said in my address, read more about him. He went to Ceylon, to the gospel, outside Africa. In fact, it was there that he was martyred, and so on. So, the gospel 
don't lose the center. If you don't, the gospel is about Christ Jesus coming to give his life to die for us, men and women, male and female, from all ethnic groups. And so what is needed to be a Christian, you can be an African Christian, European Christian, Asian Christian, but the center of that belief is no other than faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior who gave his life to all of us for our sins in order to transform us and the communities we live and make us an image in his likeness. That's what I can say, yes. Yes, uh, just a little comment. And this is where it gets exciting when there are gaps in history and who feels in what? <laughs> you know, uh, one historian said, the history of Russia is, is a suspect. Why? Because whoever is writing will write from their standpoint and fill in the missing gaps. So why did Paul not come to Africa? If an European is writing, maybe oh, Africa was not so much important. <laughs> if an African is writing, oh, there might be an African presence already. That's why Paul didn't come. So I'm happy these things are coming up. But it's also an encouragement to African scholars, particularly interested in African history, that we do more work in investigating and giving some educated guesses in the missing links. So uh, Dr. Baji Mensa is telling about uh, Mark and his time in Egypt. There might not be enough information as you will get probably the fact that Apollos was from Alexandria, which is in the book of Acts. But this will need further investigation. Um, that will mean also investigating, for example, Egyptian uh, Coptic Christianity, how they, and, and paying attention also to tradition. Some, yeah, sometimes people think church tradition, if they say Mark started a church, oh, because we don't have it written or have any evidence of a writing of it, then it's a tradition, it's, it's a myth, and all that. But these can be guides for further investigation. So, Papa, thank you very much for, for the info. Uh, let me just add this. That, I see, the church in Ethiopia, for instance, according to church history, was Mar Matthew, the one who wrote the Gospel of Matthew, who actually also came to Africa to start the church in Ethiopia, which is alive today, the Coptic Church in, in uh, Ethiopia and so on. The same way that you have one in uh, Egypt. Egypt started by St. Mark, uh, as we are saying, and the church in Ethiopia by Matthew, according to some church history. Do more research on that, you know, and I think that will really uh, help us all. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Just um, a little point to make about this um, point that Emmanuel raised about some evangelicals who um, sometimes are very uneasy when you want to talk about African Christianity. Why don't we have Christianity? No, but, but you, you can only move from uh, the particular to the general. You are a human being. You, know, you are limited to your own context. So you speak about your context. Invariably, you see what sometimes, quote unquote, they say, oh, it's Christianity. It's the European version of Christianity. You know, I mean, we don't want to go back into all the debates, you know, uh, about, but the, the mission came to Africa. A lot of the things that came were European in coloring. You know, our mode of worship, was it language or whatever. It was all, and that unfortunately gave the impression that this thing that we call Christianity is European, yeah. you know. So unless you, you stress your particular situation, your language, your context, you know, and you are, and you are human, you are limited to your context. So there's nothing wrong if you, if you talk about your context. Nothing really wrong when you talk about your context, because that is what you see, and that is where the gospel expresses itself through. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we should be running up. Yeah. The conventional wisdom is that 
Islam is the biggest threat to Christianity today. I beg to differ. I think a more serious threat is the white supremacy idea that in even within the body of Christ. Um, you, you just touch a little bit on, on, on it. Just even seeing African Christianity, some people feel threatened by that. Because in, in the way they think, if Christianity is not dressed in European. Western garb, it is not a real deal. And I'm saying no. God is proud of the various cultures. Yes. He made them, the languages. All the languages will be spoken even in heaven. Yes. And we should be proud of what God has done in Africa. Some people feel threatened when you use the term like the center of gravity of Christianity has shifted. Has shifted to Africa. They feel threatened. Why? Yes. I thought we were one body. And it is the biggest hindrance. And unless the Western church begins to think much deeper than they are thinking now, Christianity worldwide is in trouble. Because if we are indeed the center of gravity, you see, we, we, when it was our turn to watch them and learn from them, we did. <laughs> Until we are even wearing their dresses. They don't even know what we eat. That is not love. We are always going towards theirs. They are reluctant to come near ours. Is that love? Love is a two-way street. And unless that attitude is changed, Christianity is not going far anywhere. We are one body, and every culture matters. Nobody should accept to be a second-class citizen in his own father's house. It's not going to happen. We have a seat around the father's table. And the earlier they saw it, the better for all of us, the body of Christ. <laughs> you, you, you know what? You, 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 you said something that made me raise my hand. You see, when we are talking about um, Christianity, because you mentioned that something, Islam is the greatest threat, but you feel that something else is a threat. Uh, I like to say that Islam is not a threat. Yes, it's a challenge. <laughs> that, that's the word to use. And therefore, when we are talking about things that confront us, let us approach them as challenges, and we'll face the challenges. Thank you. Good. Well, the man who is speaking to us was once a time Pukmura man, a eh? program of African Christians and Muslims Relations, a chief director, you know. So thank you very much for adding that. We just want to say that one of the things about Christianity is that every culture, Christianity fits every culture, but it comes in to challenge the culture that is there in order to transform that culture in the image and likeness of Christ. The same way it does to us as individuals, changing us to be in God's image in Christ. So, if you can have European religion, Christian religion, some of them we are what we are criticizing. Some, some, there are some Africans who become Christians, and they, if they are not careful, they think they, we should ab, 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 absorb all the abusums and worship them together with Christ. And we say no. And so on. So in every culture situation, if you go to Asia, you have those challenges. That's why the scripture is there for us to read it in the context of every culture, to challenge every culture. No culture is 100% acceptable by God. Because some of them were created out of our own sins against God. So the Holy Spirit in us, reading the scriptures, help us to transform us as individual persons, as well as the social, political, economic, 
the context in which we live, the gospel transforms all into Christ's image and likeness. And that is the challenge, whether it's African, Asian, and so on. It doesn't mean that we accept our old cultural practices, like Europeans are going for their old cultural practice of uh, LPTQ, whatever QT. They were doing that before Christianity came, as I mentioned. We're not. The same way Africans can, you cannot go back now if you come to Christ to worship Abusun because Christ is Lord over all. So you will reject them and accept Jesus Christ alone as Lord and Savior. Thank you. Our time is up. So, Bishop, sorry, Bishop, uh, Bishop, and then uh, Sama Uku. Uh, sorry, our time is up. Um, but you can put the question in the chat so we can. Uh, just, just, a, just a quick question. Uh, this, who is, who is, who is, um, who is making the African Christian feel inferior? I, 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 I'm, I'm, I don't know because of my ignorance. I'm struggling a bit to understand why we are even talking about Europeans now. Because we are Christians by all means, and we have our own identity. So why, why are we so worried about European Christians? I'm, I'm really struggling with that. Okay, yeah. So, um, <laughs> do you want to respond? But I, I think uh, he's just saying that um, it's not saying that somebody is saying uh, we should um, feel inferior, but he's just saying that, uh, I mean, the, the one who was uh, sharing was just saying that, um, uh, you know, there's no reason why people should think that African Christianity should, should by all means, copy everything the Western people uh, had or the Jews had, but that we should be able to uh, see ourselves not as outsiders, but that's why you use the expression, we are sitting on the same table of, of our father uh, and not strangers. So uh, it's just uh, s uh, an expression of stating that we are not outsiders, but we are also uh, children who belong to the kingdom of God and should therefore have our own place. So, yes, yes sir. Doug, can I say just one thing? <laughs> okay, the last one. one, the last one, the last one. Please be snappy about it. Okay, yes. I will, I will. Yes, um, Doug, thank you for your lecture. Now, my main concern about the LGBTQ plus is in recent times, um, the, 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 there is the emergence of um, Christian gay fellowship in South Africa. And for me, I think that it is now time for us to trumpet the real African Christian values for the world to know that um, African Christians don't swallow just anything from the West, and that we know who we are, and that we know what it means to be an African and a Christian, and not necessarily, you know, taking whatever the West brings to us. But these are some of the things, the challenges that are emerging in recent times. And then um, I wish uh, a Prof makes a comment on about it, no, no problem. Another time will come. Well, let, I'm, I'm not a prof. I haven't reached that yet. I'm um, saying so Reverend Dr. Robert Awaji Mensa. That, but this is the point we are making, that Christianity challenges all cultures. One of the problems, just recently, I gave a, I think on uh, today is, on Wednesday, I actually gave a lecture somewhere on the religious, theological, and spiritual aspect of uh, homosexuality and their Christian response. Okay? Remember that whatever LBTQ thing is, the root of it is religious. This was the practice of European gods and goddesses 
which affected Europeans who wanted to follow their gods. So when Christianity actually came in and challenged that idea that LBTQ whatever is not what God wants us or homosexuality, eh? Constantine, Constantino, Constantine Emperor had just become converted through his mother's witness and elevation he saw. And he challenged that idea about the Europeans. Throughout the European history, they have been trying to go back to this practice. In the Victorian age in Britain, some of their top men were doing that. Okay? So you cannot continue to call yourself a Christian in Christ Jesus and practice that which is contrary to the word of God. You cannot. So if you like, you can drop the name Christian and carry on with whatever your religious practices. You cannot reject what the Bible is against, uh, accept what the Bible, sorry, accept what the Bible is against and then still call yourself who you are. It doesn't matter whether you are archbishop or whatever. Go by the word of God. Sin is sin. And remember, LBTQ is not the only sin. It's always listed among other sins. Yes. So if you want to accept it, then they accept the other sins that are linked up with it. Read your Bible very well in Galatians 5. Homosexual and so on are listed among other sins. Why not accept all the other sins then? And call yourself a Christian. Then what kind of Christian will you be? So let's be careful. Not follow those Europeans who are now not more and trying to go the way they are going. And unfortunately some of us Africans and Asians are trying to follow them. If they are rejected Christianity, they are going back to their old traditional religions, religious practices. Well, let them do so, but cancel the name Christ out of that. Hallelujah. And that's the point, I think. So let's be very careful that we don't follow them. Or whatever is sin is sin, so far as the scripture is concerned. And let's ask God. You know what? Oh, now you are going too far. When Paul was speaking to the church in Corinth and others, where they were practicing this, some of them were practicing that they have come to know Christ. And their lives have been changing. And Paul was challenging them. You cannot go back to those lives. So why do you now want us to make it part of a Christian practice? Whether you are archbishop or whatever it is. If you are wrong, you are wrong. The scripture is right. Amen. And we go by the word of God. Ask the Lord to give you the Holy Spirit to change your life. And he give you a better. Have you realized that these days, huh? Some of the people who thought they wanted to change their sexual things are crying. I can tell you here in Ghana, there is a group that's really dealing with people like that who were following this European thing, this uh, homosexual thing, even in Ghana. And they are going through all kinds of problems. And this is a Christian group that is helping them to overcome. In Europe, the story is sad. There was someone who said he was a man, he said he wanted to be a woman. They changed him and so on. Now he wants to go back. He has no money now to pay the medical people. And he's crying. What God has put <laughs> God has made you male and female. It's so simple to do. You don't need a lot of philosophy to understand whether you are male or female. Your body tells you. Eh? Lord have mercy. Amen. 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 I think it's just left with the collection. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, Hallelujah. <laughs> we want to say a very big thank you to Reverend Dr. Abaji Mensa for helping us to know that Africa it's not in the margins. We have been in the Bible. We have been in the center of the Bible. And so, even though scholars have tried to marginalize us, the scriptures do not marginalize us. We have a place. We are part of the Commonwealth of Israel, the new Israel. And so, when we take our time, 
to read our scriptures, we see that Africans have always been from the very beginning in the plan of God. It's not a recent thing that, or an afterthought, God has always had the Africans and have always had Africa to also be part of his people. And Dr. Abayimas has made us to see even Moses marrying an African, being trained in African soil. So Africans were not just non-entities, were people of val uh, value who contributed. And therefore, not today when people think that Africans are just beggars going around looking for for, for people uh, leftovers. There was once upon a time that Africa really had a place. And I think it's a challenge to us to see and to work hard so that we go back to, who, to where God wants us to be. So thank you very much for making us to, to see that we are not strangers, we are parts, and Christ came for all of us. He's our savior. In fact, Africa provided security, security for him when his life was being threatened. So we have played a very, very important role in the history of God's salvation, and God continues to reach out to us. It's my prayer that we African Christians should embrace the Lord Jesus Christ and be champions in propagating the good news. Let's send the good news back to uh, those who are rejecting the Christian faith. And here I want to congratulate Bishop um, Matheson and others, those of you in the diaspora, uh, Dr. Pebby and others. May God bless you for the, your ministries there. Continue to work hard and continue to lead the flag of Africa high. But above all, we need to let people know that the Christian faith is our faith and we should not feel that um, we need to be Africans, uh, to be European before God will accept us. God has already accepted us. And thank you for reminding us. So I want to say a big thank you to all of you for your support, your, your comments, your questions and your comportment. God bless us all. Thank you. Maybe a, a clap of ring for our chairperson. So I'll give some couple of announcements as we round up. Um, in the beginning, I mentioned that this is a CCAC program, Center for the Study of Early African Christianity here at the Akrofi Christella Institute of Theology, Mission, and Culture. We have two other major programs that we've been running. Uh, the first being what we've termed the Walls Odin Bidiakon Lecture Series on Early African Christianity. We have it twice a year, in April and then in October. We've had the April edition already. This year's October edition, we caption it as a student edition. So we will be inviting students, graduate students for that matter, who are into Christian history or early African Christianity, to have a kind of colloquium, uh, present papers, and then interact with them as we've done. We also do have, which we've not been running, but we are giving the invitation, if you are a church leader, whether in your own local church or with the local council of churches, you want to learn more about early African Christian figures and some lessons on their leadership as uh, Christian leaders, you can contact us. We have what we call Early African Christian Ministry Forum, where we discuss the likes of St. Anthony of Egypt, uh, St. Augustine, and others. Uh, Dr. Abadji Mensah is here will be one of our resource persons if need be. Uh, so we can learn from these early African Christian leaders and how they went about ministry in their time and context. So that you can watch out for that as well. 
And then uh, there is something in the pipeline by way of partnership. Uh, we had Dr. Yao Pebi and another voice here, uh, passionate, of course, as you can see from the gesturing. But look out for a kind of a seminar launching activity where we will put in on paper a uh, developing partnership with this Africa Center for Mission Mobilization and Research. African Center for Mission Mobilization and Research. Dr. Yapebi is leading that, and uh, we have the board chairman with us, Reverend Dr. Solomon Aite. You heard his voice uh, in his contribution. So watch out for that um, partnership as it's finalized in an MOU, where we hope to have joint programs and share resources on how best. Indeed, as Yapebi was passionate about, enough African resources on African uh, Christian activity and also African contribution to world Christianity as we will have in the uh, academic setting and also in the practical side of things. So thank you all once again for coming. Um, we don't have place for a vote of thanks, so I'll take the opportunity to thank you all. Uh, my former presiding bishop, grateful for your time. <laughs> a round of applause again. <laughs> As they say, a bishop is always a bishop. Uh, even if on the streets, you have to preach and give an altar call. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sulesa, for chairing this uh, program and uh, also for your contribution and comments. Of course, um, CCAC is just one of the other centers we have at ACI. We heard uh, Dr. Ambilia's voice when Islam was mentioned. Um, so you can visit our website, uh, aci.edu.gh, to learn more about other centers here we have. And thank you also to our moderator, Well Reverend uh, Dr. James Kweku Walton, my colleague and associate of CCAC, who also moderated. Now, on that note, I'll invite him to also run up for us as we close and depart from you. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, Dr. Gizi, Director, and thank you once again for all um, the people who have been part of this uh, event. As has been indicated on the program that you have received, Dr. Solomon Aiti will give to us the closing prayer. So can you come up here, so? Shall we bow our heads? Heavenly Father, we want to, with all humility, we want to thank you that right from day one, you were thinking about Africa. And look at all the efforts you have put in, all the investment that the men of old put in so that Africa will be saved. Father, let the things we are hearing today inspire us to be the best we can be, each one of us. To give everything we are and we have for the cause of Christ on this continent. Father, we pray that you would Shake the nations of Africa once more. Lord, visit us with a kind of revival in missions. So would rise up and take the button that others are passing on to us and do the job of reaching the lost, rescuing the perishing, caring for the dying. Lord, Start a movement that cannot be stopped out of Africa to the rest of the world for the cause of Christ and for the sake of the souls of men. We thank you for this institution here and what you are doing with ACI. 
Lord, we pray that your blessings would never leave this house and that they would walk in the paths that you have given them through the vision that our brother brought to this school. Lord, we thank you for what you've done. Thank you for our speaker. We pray that you would pour wisdom and, and grace and more mercy on his life, his family, and his ministry. And for the rest of us, help us. Lord, continue to help us to be the best we can be because of Jesus and what he has done. This is what we're asking. And we pray in the matchless name, the name of Jesus. And everybody agreed and said, Amen. Amen.